There's been a great deal of enthusiasm about the rebirth of comedy and satire in America. One of the first to prove that there is an audience for literate and devastating humor is my guest today, sometimes called the king of the sacred cow punchers, Mr. Mort Saul. Mr. Saul, for three years before you got your first break, I understand you were earning an average of about $46 from your, a year from your performances and writing. What kept you going? I was waiting for this rebirth. It's still keeping me going. What rebirth? Well, it's, you began it, and then there was uh, a whole group of comedians, that, uh, such as uh, Lane May, Mike Nichols. Yeah, I'd like Lenny to review Bruce. them with you if you have time. Well, sure. Wh which one, uh, uh, who of them uh, have to do with any rebirth? Mike Nichols is a director, and Elaine May is a writer. I, I've tried to see them perform. They don't work anywhere. Lenny they did Bruce, for a while. Where? Well, when? They, 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 they had a show right in New York, a, a review. And they did something about ago. high school people necking and something about Freud. I'd hardly call that social reform. I don't agree with you about the comedians at all. I think, as a matter of fact, they're delinquent as citizens. Uh, the only time they're interested in politics is when they're starstruck with the president and they're invited to the White House, which is a containment policy <laughs> anyway. Well, do you mean then that the comedian has to be socially concerned and a social reformer? He not only has to be a social reformer, I mean, if he wants to be, but he has to be critical of his colleagues, like a good psychiatrist. Well, fire. Well, I just, I think they're delinquent as citizens. I think they look the other way. I think they're amoral. Well, someone like Lenny Bruce is, is, is uh, criticized for looking uh, so hard into society and criti criticizing it so uh, violently he that, that he, he won't even be tolerated. He has the morality of a 15-year-old. I mean, squares don't know what he's talking about. And hip people, that occurred to them when they were 12. There's nothing profound about what he does. But you cannot waste your time. You've only got so much time as an adult, and you have to listen to illumination. There's nothing happening with that. In other words, uh, that kind of entertainment, I just don't think it's enlightening. And it's not social reform. I think people confuse chronology. A lot of people came along about the same time. But let's give the audience a bow, not the performers. The audience showed that there was an appetite. They demonstrated that. The performers didn't meet the appetite. Are you implying then that you're the only one that's meeting the appetite? Well, I do what I do. I've been d defending that for the last 10 years. <laughs> but the thing that I do is concerned with, uh, you know, that's concerned by itself. But in other words, when I'm shot down in flames, I go down on the plane alone. I don't see a lot of company. When I'm doing well, I hear about this group, this new wave. There is no new wave. Well, what about the Second City, for instance? Now, that's political satire. It, no, no, it isn't. When? When did you ever see them do political satire? Oh, they... I've never seen any. They do, they do ones on the uh, on the candidates and on. Uh, they're also social satire on psychology, on phoniness of uh, art uh, lovers, this well, kind of thing. All but all of that is safe. It's only daring if you know. It's not very daring to come into New York and do jokes about a segregationist. It's all safe. I don't. None of that shakes me up. I find that very. And you know, I'm speaking not as a comedian, but as a member of the audience. Do you mean that you uh, demand that they go after the uh, political and social ills of the time? No. I mean, is this what? No. What are you? I only make that? demands on myself. I don't make any demands on anyone else. Well, you're doing it right now. I mean, but you're one, dismissing no, them. No, I. Oh, that's different. Once I'm making a demand, dismissal oh. is not the same as payment on demand. You can't make a demand for someone who has no funds. Let me put it that way. <laughs> All right, so you're not making demands, but you, you, in order uh, for you to approve of them, what, what would you li like to see the other comedians be doing? Oh, no, they should do whatever they like to do. That's up to them, whether it's uh, Jerry Lewis or Jonathan Winters or whoever. Let them do what they want to do. But they should not pass themselves, as imp pass themselves off as improvisational or satirical. Satire is a pretty good word. You know, when you say that, I'm thinking about people like Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. There's nobody of that caliber around me today. I don't see them. I know, because I have nights off and I go out to see people. You know, I don't call it satirical to talk about sex in the suburbs. That's not satire. That's nonsense. It's playing footsie under the table. What is satire? Satire is a, a literarily based X-ray of the society. It's an onslaught. It's an attack. And believe me, this country needs an attack. This country needs a critic. It's the best thing I could have is a critic on staff. That would mean we're alive and we're vital. Mr. Saul, you say that things need to be attacked. Society needs to be attacked. Of course what it does. Aspe what aspects, most of all? What aspects? Yeah. Well, uh, many aspects need to be attacked. Uh, in other words, uh, the whole value system needs to be scrutinized. Uh, whether or not people are acquisitive has to be scrutinized. It's not just politics. People have to, uh, in other words, uh, a political interpretation is all right, but a sociological interpretation, whether or not the roles uh, are changing between men and women in America, why monogamy is crumbling. 
in the Western world, not only in America. We have to find out uh, why. Uh, we have to find out about violence. We ha we have to find out a lot of things. We have to listen with the third ear, as Dr. Reich said, if we can develop one. Well, does the humorist, or do you try to uh, illuminate or to uh, reform? I mean, what is the <laughs> what's the importance of it? What's the importance of what I yeah, do? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. You'll have to ask the critics that write about it. <laughs> uh, the importance is that I can do it. That's the miracle. What do you hope to achieve? Let's put it that way, whether you do it or not. Well, I'm accepted on my own terms. There are a lot of people in the audience who think what I think, but because of the social structure and certain restrictions imposed by themselves upon themselves, they are accountants and uh, executives and uh, taxi drivers and everything else. And I happen to have, uh, because of a psychological reaction, probably, uh, have found this outlet. I can articulate, so I speak for them. The day I stop speaking for them and only for myself, I probably will not be working. Well, you said you've got to examine, one has to examine such things as the changing role of women, of, of the sure, system, va of of the system of values. Well, granted, you have to examine them. What, what have you come up with? What system have you come up with yourself? What uh, system, system of what? of values. What system of values mm -hmm. have I come up with? Well, I, say, I mean, there, it's apparent that certain values, uh, you know, I uh, tripped over because they were there. They're as old as the rocks. I didn't discover them. I rediscovered them because they have been obfuscated under a crustacean of uh, debris in our society today. Uh, I, there are only certain things you cling to. Uh, whether you recognize a virtue, whether you recognize a decency, whether you are loyal, certain values, that's all. Whether you're capable of not running away, whether you're more in your own way than other people are in your way, and, and whether or not you can deal with other people. In other words, what is emerging as a human being? Being your own man, being honest to yourself? What, what do you mean by well, Being your own man is the most important thing for anybody. Being your own person. That's tough. I mean that when you meet someone who is sane and level and has a balance of values, don't think that normal means average. It's an achievement to be a normal human being and it should not be passed off. Civilized people should be prized. Uh, that's what I mean. Oh. Are you a normal human being? Am I normal? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, that's a pretty, that would be a subjective... Uh, Are you your own man, then? Very much so. Very much my own man. Well, from the way that you doesn't make you normal. From the way you describe it, the the uh, values are not particularly obscure. I mean, they're very obvious ones that you that you. Uh, no, people obscure them. They're not, they're not obscure to begin with. Look, they're traditional. They only become radical when people uh, try to obfuscate them. For instance, uh, I'm my own man, but that's not all of it. That's only Act One. Act Two is, does it all fit into place? What does it cost to be your own man? If you get on the stage twice a night for 45 minutes and you have to pay for it by being in pain the rest of the day in conflict with people, that's an excessive cost and possibly an unnecessary, you know, not necessary. So you have to examine that. You have to find out. So being your own man is only act one. There's act two and act three. Do you find that there's much resistance to the point of view that you, uh, you have? and express in yourself. Well, sometimes there is, but it depends if uh, you're, ahead, you're ahead of yourself. In other words, if I have a view of uh, the world and uh, other people don't have the view, they will reject it. I mean, if, I would think everyone would ascribe to the view that virtue and decency and, and uh, honesty are, are well, good Well, it sounds like, have. you know, if you put it down like that, it sounds like a Boy Scout oath. That's not what I'm right. saying. I mean that if you make a remark about a public figure and you get resistance from the audience, that doesn't mean they don't agree with you. It has come to mean that they do. And it's like people know that someone, they, they resent it when they know somebody isn't making it and you remind them. And one of their reactions is to pull away. Only a naive performer would say, uh, well, I've said something they don't agree with. It's not that. It's that they do agree with it. They know. In other words, it's some people they don't know at all and there's some people they know all too well. And that's the difference. Well, it, it's been said that... Uh after the Eisenhower administration uh, and, and frame of mind uh, was over, that uh, you lost some of the inspiration and mordancy for your for your jokes. Do you think this is true at all? Who said it? Oh, it's a, you read it and, and and hear it in comments. But well, the, 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 was your uh, is that qualified as gospel? No, <laughs> no, no, I'm just I'm no. Just as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the two best records I made, in my opinion, 
uh, were made during the Kennedy administration. But uh, they're all fair game. There's no utopia in sight. There's no imminent danger of a utopia in the government. And uh, I, uh, the only people that say that are usually Democrats who don't want to hear a Democrat attacked. So then they tell you that uh, jokes about Eisenhower are funny. <laughs> That's because they have no mercy toward uh, Vice President Nixon. Uh, and they're scared to death that they'll lose, uh, they have fallen idols in the Democratic Party. I'm not scared to death. That's my secret. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to get your opinions about some of the candidates for, for office. How do you like Goldwater? Goldwater's too easy. All the comedians are going to make jokes about Goldwater. Goldwater is a temptation because he looks like an extreme. So socially irresponsible performers are going to make jokes about him. But the more subtler areas and the greater threats are the people who are going to run. And if you're a responsible adult, you should get into, you know, one, I should say, one should get into that area. We don't have to start with an extreme Republican. We should start with the Democratic Party. Well, let's start with Johnson then. <laughs> the Democrats were the ones, uh, you know, who ridiculed him when he was the vice president about his not being around. Uh, all of these, uh, the, the great satirists on a program called That Was the Week That Was, were always talking about Johnson, the, you know, the vanishing American. Where is he? The vice president has vanished. Now they're telling me he's wonderful. Well, I can't adjust that rapidly. I don't fall in love at first sight with anybody. Uh, Johnson was elected to Congress in 1936, I believe. He's been in politics all his life and suddenly found himself in government. And there's a wide gulf involved there. Then he received, uh, the next we heard he had received a stereo set from Bobby Baker, and then uh, he would have been better off accepting components because he could put them in the closet along with Bobby Baker and the entire affair. Now now we uh, he, we hear that, uh, you know, he is the only candidate that the uh, Democratic Party has. So uh, I would, uh, that seems odd. You know, I thought the Democratic Party was, uh, you know, abundant in wonderful people. I mean, at least to hear the Democrats say it. But they, I wonder how far the Democrats can rationalize before they say anything. They went from Roosevelt to Truman to Stevenson to Kennedy to Johnson. They're just going to keep going. I think you could bring uh, – you. I, I once said that I believe Khrushchev could be uh, nominated on the Democratic ticket by their saying he's better than Nixon. That's the whole, Democrats' whole facade. They have no program except who else is there, which is hardly a program. I'd never get married on that basis. So there's Johnson, and I get, I get if he'll run, he hasn't told us yet. We don't know yet. <laughs> so once he ends the suspense. But uh, politics, are, you know, politics are part of the act. Some nights I don't do it at all. Well, who else? You said uh, not the extremists that you should begin with, like Goldwater. What, what, what about um, um, Rockefeller? How do you feel about him? What, Governor Rockefeller? Yeah. Well, he's probably a right-wing social democrat. I mean, if we... Uh, I have a system of categories, you know, I should explain to you. That helps me. I have 81 categories. <laughs> that makes it simple. It simplifies it for me. Uh, Go Governor Rockefeller is, uh, as a matter of fact, is closer uh, to the Kennedy line of thinking than the president is. That's one of the ironies of our time. I have a Republican leader who is left of the Democratic president. It's only ironic if you believe in the system. And the system... What system? Anyway, Governor Rockefeller is... Uh, there's Governor Rockefeller who lives in this apartment house with Nixon, as I understood it. That was generically, that's how it started. They live in the same apartment house and his ex-wife. Rocky and his friends live in this apartment house. Then there's, uh, he then went to New Hampshire where the people, I, the press interprets uh, his defeat up there as the fact that people didn't like the fact that he got married. That's considered immoral, getting married. In the circles I grew up in, that's considered very moral. <laughs> there are more immoral acts than, uh, not, than getting married. But... Uh, Rocky and Happy. Everybody has a nickname. Lady Bird, uh, Happy, Jackie. We have a lot of that. They don't go much for grace in this era. And uh, I don't mean capital G. But uh, First Lady's you know, going by grace. By the way, I want, I want to make a point here. Uh, there's a broker's attitude in America that's very unhealthy. It goes like, uh, it's a broker's attitude about winning. People say, that guy hasn't got a chance. But they never evaluate that guy, unquote. That's an italics, that term, that guy. Uh, they go by ratings. I watched so-and-so show. It had the highest rating on television. But they, don't, they never lament the fact that something worthwhile had a low rating. They just kind of want to get with the winners. I never have understood that. 
but it's more prevalent now than it has ever been in the last in the last 10 years that, I, that I've noticed. Uh, it's become more prevalent. We have uh, widespread throughout the country. People say, brokers' attitude. Rockefeller doesn't have a chance. They're the first ones, if he were elected, who'd be standing in line to say, shake hands with the president. These people were ridiculing Johnson as a man who wasn't vice president. Robert Kennedy was a vice president, in effect. Now they turn around and they're saying, we're certainly lucky to have him at the helm. If you could choose anybody in the whole, uh, in the whole country, not even one necessarily that's running, wh whom uh, might you pick? Do you have any ideas on that? Well, uh, yeah, I have a lot of ideas on it. I just don't know how advantageous it would be to display them now. Uh, I can't believe that in a country of 200 million people in the United, the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. I can't believe that all the talent available to us, from William O. Douglas to Dr. Oppenheimer to all the people in the lab at Caltech, that the greatest person we have is Senator Johnson. Besides, if he's president, who's going to run that majority? Since he ran it so well, everyone discovered. They didn't say that when he was running it. It's wonderful how retrospect, but in hindsight, is beautiful. Monday morning quarterbacks. And Cassius Clay is the champion. We've got great leadership. When are you going to run for office? I'm not interested in politics. You're not? I'm going to do a play in the fall. Well, uh, why do you choose this play? What is it? The sign in Sydney? Bruce, Bruce Dean's, Dean's Window. window. Uh, well, uh, what is it about? Why, it's about the dilemma of this generation, and it's about a guy who's his own man. And it's something that I, uh, you know, it's a different way to say something. I don't want to be an actor, and I wouldn't be looking for a play if I wasn't doing this one. This is very special. What's and your role in it? I, my role is, it's me if I had gone right <laughs> <laughs> instead of wrong. Uh, I, it's Lorraine Hansberry's first play since Raising the Sun, and it's with Rita Marino, and it's, it's going to be very exciting play is, uh, it's a real bite, because it says something, talks about the nobility of man, it has to do with something. It's not uh, another homosexual song in the theater. Have you seen many shows since you've been in New York? Well, I've been working seven days a yeah, week. Yeah, you don't, you don't get a chance. Well, I try to see something when I'm here. The last time I was here, I, uh, I went to the theater a couple of times. And uh, most of the New York shows, I have to wait till I come to Los Angeles to see them. But uh, the New York theater is highly overrated. The snobbery is not justified. And it's usually indulged in by people who have gone, been promoted and gone to Hollywood and then find it fashionable to rap Hollywood after accepting its gifts and coming back here. And well, it's, it's not so overrated now because all they talk about is how sick the theater is and how bad it is. It is very bad. That's right, but at least it's not overrated. They're, they're diagnosing the, the uh, malady well, there. Look at the, the actor's studio. They get enough publicity in a year, didn't they? I mean, they do. Mm. Dynamite Tonight played one performance. I mean, what right do they have to look down on other people? Based on what? Their job is to communicate with the audience. I know the audience gets in their hair and bothers them, but there it is. That's the theater. When you get up and talk and there's an audience, that's theater. And that's all it is. Well, that's when you equation. say you're interested in theater, what, what aspects or what, what do you like about it most? Anyway, you can communicate ideas to people. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean they have to accept them. Just so they, they're shook up, they, you leave them with something residual when they leave. I don't care if they disagree. They can write letters. But the big thing is that they either reinforce their own prejudice or they change their minds or they change yours or whatever. But it's an interchange of ideas. That's what it's for. And until we have coffee houses again, we'll have to settle up at theater for an exchange of ideas. What, what plays have you seen recently that you think achieved that? Or? Ideas? Yeah. Oh, man, man for Commute. all seasons, probably. Mm. Uh, but how, how do you like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Did you see I that? I don't like it. Because that has a, a pretty uh, uh, critical view of the changing roles of uh, man and woman. By someone who hasn't practiced marriage, has he? No, he hasn't. Well, he's a critic of it. Yes, but you don't have to practice everything you criticize. You're a critic of politics. You're not a politician. Well, yeah, but that's, I don't think that that analogy holds up. That's the obvious analogy, but I don't uh, think that holds up. I didn't stand up and say, it's anarchy. All politicians are corrupt. There is no hope. There's no note of hope in that play, that there is no way out. I don't accept that. Do you, are you an optimist? Do you think there is you a... Bet I am. Do, do, do I got out of bed this morning. I must be. <laughs> if I were a nihilist, I wouldn't take the trouble to say I'm one on the, my, on the, on the yes. you know, on the show. Do you think that things are getting better? Yes, slowly. Uh, not quickly enough. That's the only complaint I have, and uh, that's the only impatience I display. Of course, they're getting better. There's several signs that they're getting better, but boy, is it an uphill fight? You know, we're swimming through glue. It's a tough time. A lot of impediments going. Uh, it's tough. We're paying an excessive cost for what we accomplish because we're buying time. 
What kind of things do you think indicate an improvement in c- conditions? Well, when a guy like uh, Marlon Brando is the highest paid actor in Hollywood, and he's also the best actor, it's good. You know, he's not off-Broadway somewhere obscure, and, and people can go down there and say, well, I like him, but he's not commercial. That's good. And when I can say what I say and have a large audience, that's encouraging. Now, th- these are in the areas of theater. When, uh, uh, But do you think Marlon Brando, since he's become successful, hasn't he uh, become less good well, since the early a, days? That's a typical middle-class, right-wing, social-democratic reaction. <laughs> that's only three of your 81 in category. Uh, yeah, well, in other words, unless that's the same old thing. No, of course, he got better. The more he was encouraged, he had more confidence, he worked more, and he was on steadier feet, so to speak. And in other words, you equate success with corruption oh, and not, discovery not just with in, just in ability. This, in this case, I, I wasn't convinced that he was getting better since he was getting more popular. You're darn right he's getting better. He's the best we have. Oh, well, I'm not saying he may not be the best we have, but I don't think Mutiny on the Bounty or, or uh, The Ugly American is as good as, say, The Wild One or, or uh, some of his early uh, theater performances. I'll anyway, go with yeah. you line for line with Marlon Brando. One-Eyed Jacks is the best directorial job I've ever seen in a motion picture. Mm-hmm. Bar none, including David Lean, for whom I have the utmost respect. I worship his work. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, the performance in uh, Mutiny on the Bounty is a virtuoso performance. He's one of the greatest comedians we have on screen. Great sense of comedy. Most actors are cumbersome in comedy. He's brilliant. There were 27 separate scripts on Bounty, and he should not have to pick up the tab for that. That's not his fault, that confusion. Mm-hmm. He's always convincing. And remember, his virtue is that he brings something to a role. He brings something to it. So does Steve McQueen. Uh, the people who come in and are themselves are not acting. He brings something to a role, and he takes a chance. Now, he tried in The Ugly American, and perhaps you feel he missed, but he tried. The courage to look, to inspect, and to try to lift things, to be uplifting. He's a moral person. What are the signs, aside from Marlon Brando and, and you? Well, you know... I didn't limit the world to that. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm you saying. Know, you're doing a review of this as you do it, which is unfair. What? Uh, you're doing a review of this tape as you conduct it. No, uh, you I, know, I just was You're either going to be a moderator person. or you're going to choose up sides. If you want to debate with me, uh, that'll be different. Then you'll probably lose oh, I because I know this that. area. But, you know, I'm not, you know I'm not, I don't have my boxing gloves on here. There are several signs. In other words... Uh, We signed a limited test ban with the Russians. We know that. Uh, We also know that that eventually uh, the minority groups are going to come into their own in this country, whatever the motivation. What is your opinion on the uh, civil rights bill as it's being uh, I think the bill is a joke. The Mm -hmm. bill is a joke. It's an exercise in uh, emotional cathartics for some people. It's profit for separationists, be they white or dark. Mm -hmm. And... uh, it's candy coated. It has no teeth in it. It's just a term. Yeah. But it's a start. Or I could say the president is getting civil rights off to a whopping stop. What do you think about the feminine mystique? Or the, you know, the idea that women should express themselves in careers. Well, there's a lot that's that's valid in Betty Friedan's book, but there's a lot that isn't. And uh, it's in a you know it's the remarks are made in a very strident tone. Although I agree with many of them. It's just that her assumption in some areas, or the women who read it assume, probably, that they have something to say. See, I think women are frauds in the sense that they're too competitive in America, and they don't have anything to offer. Uh, It's bad enough to be competitive when you marry a guy, but (laughs) when you really don't want to compete, then you're a hypocrite. You're a liar. Women lie. They say, oh, I want to do this, and I want to do that. They don't want to do that. They are female impersonators. They don't want to be girls, but they don't want to be men either, because that's tough. You have to perform when you're a man, and it is not in the nature of woman to perform. It's very tough on them. Uh, In other words, all women are really worried about is being abandoned. Men are the ones who have to perform, and they do have to perform, whether it is uh, in business or in the service, they have to be brave or they have to be noble in their public life, or whether they have to perform, uh, uh, you know, in the act of love or whatever, to be graphic. Uh, Men have to perform. Women have to uh, kind of organize life. 
but they don't want to do that. So they say, well, you know, I don't have a chance to express myself. Then they become the protest group. I don't, uh, I don't believe them. See, I don't think they really want to. Uh, I don't think that they really want to compete. Ask, you know, you don't have to ask me. Ask somebody who's well equipped. Ask uh, the psychology department at Columbia. Ask any of the uh, people up there who admit people to graduate school. The dependency rate with women. See if they don't have figures to accommodate their view that women are not dependable. If they marry, then they're back in school, then they're out of school. Ask them up there. And they're, they're fellows who are not biased. Many of them are therapists. Mr. Soling, in your um, acts, you use a lot of psychological terminology. Yeah. Do you take <laughs> so, psychology very seriously? Have you studied it? Uh, I don't know anything. I don't, no, I haven't studied it. I, well, I mean, I have uh, to, in school, but not to any great degree. I, uh, I do that as a kind of a put-on. That's mm -hmm. the kid, the, the generation. That's a sideways poke in the ribs at the elbow in the ribs. It sounds like a, a restaurant where <laughs> advertising men would drink in New York. Advertising men will drink most anywhere in New York. That's the wonderful thing about them. They have a universality. Uh, no, I, uh, I use those terms as a put-on to reflect the generation that uses the terms and doesn't know what they mean. Uh, most people think that's valid. I don't know what I'm talking about. That's a, you know, It's just like people who use uh, musicians' language are very rarely hip. They're usually hep. You're playing a lot of uh, big clubs now, like Copacabana here in New York. Uh, do you find the audiences there appreciate your stuff as much as when you were in uh, smaller smaller places? It's a commercial venture. The owners would not beckon me, of course, if I didn't get to the audiences. But if I'm really rooting for my side, you've got to get through to people. You can't discriminate against them and uh, put them into a small room and say that's the only way. Uh, the Blue Angel is nothing but expense accounts and guys with white socks, but people think that that's uh, very intellectualized and hip on the east side, and it's not. You, wherever there are people and a microphone, you can work. Now, it's tough to be the first one in, but you got to do it if you believe in what you're doing. If you just sh choose your shots, you're not a champion. Thank you very much, Mr. Salt.